Good day. The topic of lecture 10 is different classifications of sentences. We'll discuss communicative and structural types of English sentences, structural semantic classification of composite sentences, and functional semantic types of subordinate clauses. We'll begin with the communicative types of sentences. The sentence is a communicative unit. Therefore, the primary classification of sentences should be based on the communicative principle. That's according to the purpose of communication. Every sentence, whatever its concrete meaning might be, has one of the following three goals. Giving information, for instance, the book is interesting. Asking for information, for instance, is the book interesting? And expressing inducement. Give me the book. According to the purpose of communication, sentences are classified into three main types. Declarative, interrogative, and imperative sentences. These communicative sentence types stand in strict opposition to each other and their inner properties of form and meaning are immediately correlated with corresponding features of the listener's responses. The declarative sentence expresses a statement either affirmative or negative and as such stands in syntagmatic correlation with the listener's responding signals of attention. For instance, it was getting dark and the streets looked deserted. The imperative sentence expresses inducement. That is, it urges the listener in the form of request or a command to perform or not to perform a certain action. As such, the imperative sentence is situationally connected with the corresponding verbal or action response from the addressee showing that the inducement is either fulfilled or rejected. For instance, let's go and sit down up there, Jimmy. Very well, then shut the piano and let's go. Diana closed the piano without noise and rose. The interrogative sentence expresses a question. That's a request for information wanted by the speaker from the listener. By virtue of this communicative purpose, the interrogative sentence is naturally connected with an answer, forming together with it a question-answer adjacency pair. For instance, did you know about it? You'd better ask him about it. There are four main types of questions in modern English. They are differentiated from each other, on the basis of the type of reply they expect. These types of questions are yes-no questions that expect affirmation or negation in answer. For instance, have you brought my book? And the answer is yes or no. The second type is represented by special questions which are formed with the help of one of the following interrogative words such as who, whom, whose, what, which, when, where, how, why, and which expect a reply from an open range of replies. For instance, what's your name? And we have an open range of replies here. The answer might be Nick, Anne, or David, or how old are you? And the answer is 18 or 12 or 52, so the reply is again open. The third type comprises alternative questions which expect a reply to one of two or more options presented in the question. Would you like to go for a walk or stay at home? I'd rather stay at home. The fourth type includes tag questions in which maximum inducement is expressed by a tech question added to a statement which is given in the form of a declarative sentence. For instance, John recognized you, didn't she? The boat has not left, has it? 
Some grammarians, for example, Quirk, Greenbaum and Rich speak about the fourth communicative type of sentences, that is, an exclamatory sentence. Exclamatives are sentences which have an initial phrase introduced by the lexemes what and how, and usually with the subject verb order. Exclamatory sentences are used for expressing the extent of emotion to which the speaker is impressed by something. For instance, what a fine watch he received for his birthday, or how nice to see you again. Now we'll discuss structural types of sentences. Depending on the number of the grammatical subject predicate relationship, sentences in English are divided into simple and composite. Simple sentences are monopredicative by structure as they contain one subject predicate relationship, while composite sentences are polypredicative since they comprise two or more subject predicate relationships. Simple sentences are subdivided into one member and two member sentences, whereas composite sentences are subdivided into compound and complex ones. A two-member sentence pattern is typical in English. But there are two structural types of two-member simple sentences, unexpanded and expanded. The unexpanded simple sentence is formed only by obligatory members such as the subject, the predicate, and the direct object when necessary. For example, the boy is sleeping, or Tom wrote a letter. The expanded simple sentence includes both the obligatory members and some optional secondary members, indirect object, attributes, or adverbial modifiers. For instance, syntactic parsing of the sentence the tall trees by the island shore we are shaking violently in the wind shows that it is an expanded simple sentence built upon the key string, the trees we are shaking, with the help of a number of optional secondary parts modifying and expanded the predication. In our sentence, tall is an attribute modifying the subject, by the island shore is an adverbial modifier of place, violently is an adverbial modifier of manner, and in the wind is prepositional object. One member sentences contain only one principal member of the sentence, which is not related to the other principal member, as is the case in a two member sentences, where the subject and the predicate are grammatically coordinated. There are two kinds of one-member sentences in modern English. Substantival one-member sentences like morning, autumn, another day of frog, what a nice house, etc. And verbal one-member sentences that are mainly represented by impersonal sentences in which no agent is required. The position of the so-called dummy subject being assumed by the formal it. Impersonal sentences are used to denote atmospheric conditions, for instance, it's getting dark, it's raining, it was very cold yesterday. Time, for instance, it's morning, it's ten o'clock, it's my birthday next Sunday, and distance, it is not very far from here or it's just one stop to the opera house. Now we'll discuss the composite sentence. A composite sentence is a sentence which contains two or more clauses. A clause is a unit which consists of a subject which may sometimes be dummy and a predicate and which is itself a part of a larger unit, that is, a part of a sentence. Clauses may be independent, that's coordinate, and dependent, that's subordinate. 
independent clauses are of the same rank as none of them is part of the other, while subordinate clauses are always embedded or contained within the main clause, hence they are also known as embedded clauses. Now we'll discuss structural semantic types of composite sentences. According to the type of clauses, the composite sentence may be subdivided into two structural semantic classes of sentences, compound and complex. A compound sentence consists of two or more independent clauses, which have equal syntactic status that are its constituent main clauses. There are no syntactic restrictions on their order, although this sentence may not make good sense. For example, this sentence, the wind blew and the rain poured, is compound because it consists of two independent clauses, the wind blew and the rain poured. Different from a compound sentence, a complex sentence consists of one main clause and one or more subordinate clauses. The terms main and subordinate imply that the clauses in the complex sentence do not have the same syntactic status. Subordinate clauses are always embedded or contained either within the main clause or within another subordinate clause. For instance, when the moon rose, he flew back to the house. Or presently we saw the French painter who occasionally played chess with Strickland. Now we'll focus on some features of English main clauses. Not all main clauses are possible independent clauses. Sometimes the main clause can't occur alone because it is missing a subject or a subject complement that's predicative. In such cases, the position of a subject or its complement is filled in by an embedded subordinate clause. Embedded clauses that constitute subjects or subject complements, that's nominal predicatives, are called clausal subjects or clausal predicatives. For instance, in this sentence, that Chris liked me so much did not surprise me, the entire subordinate clause, that Chris liked him so much, is embedded within the main clause as its subject. The same can be said about this sentence. The problem is that she does not love him at all, in which the predicative is missing. Its position being filled in, by the embedded subordinate clause that she does not love him at all. The evidence that this embedded clause is a predicative to the main clause is that it can be replaced by an adjective such as difficult, as a result of which we get a sentence, the problem is difficult. The main clause does not have to precede this subordinate clause or clauses as either order is possible. The main clause can also occur between subordinate clauses as in this sentence. If you compare Lee with Kim, you will find Kim is taller. Here, the main clauses you will find located in the middle, while it's preceded by the conditional clause if you compare Lee with Kim, and followed by object subordinate clause. Each complex sentence has just one main clause, but more than one subordinate clause. The main clause in English can't have a complementizer, while embedded clauses can. Complementizers are words that introduce subordinate clauses. Therefore, they are subordinating words in the sentences below. Complementizers are underlined. You see these underlined words on your monitors. I'll see. I'll read these sentences. My friend claimed that Lee thought that Cat liked chips. 
or when the moon rose, he flew back to the happy prince, or presently we came to the house where Strickland lived, or I wondered whether they wanted to go to see him. So we have in these sentences, we have such complementizers or subordinating words as that in the first sentence, when in the second, we are in the third, and whether in the last clause. Only main clauses have subject auxiliary inversion to form yes-no questions. We provide some examples which illustrate how the subjects of the main clauses undergo inversion with an auxiliary verb. For instance, did my friend claim that Lee sold that carry life chips? Or if you compare Lee with Kim, will you find Kim is taller? And finally, only main clauses have a tag question. Tag questions are usually tagged on to the end of the entire sentence and have as their subject a pronoun that matches the subject of the main clause. Since they also use subject auxiliary inversion, tag questions are only found in main clauses. For instance, if you compare Lee with Kim, you will find Kim is taller, won't you? Now, we'll analyze types of connectional clauses in a composite sentence. Clauses in a composite sentence may be linked syndetically, asyndetically, and with the help of inverted word order. Clauses are connected syndetically when they are linked by means of coordinating or subordinating conjunctions and connective words such as adverbs and pronouns. For instance, it was very cold and the children stayed at home. Or, I know where he lives. Or, I know what he said. When more than two clauses are linked, it is usual to insert the coordinator only once between the two units as in this sentence. The wind roared, the lightning flashed, and the clouds raced across the sky. In polysynthetic coordination, however, the coordinator is repeated between each clause. For instance, the wind roared, and the lightning flashed, and the clouds raced across the sky. The conjunctions and, or, and that are not members of the sentences, whereas connective words where, when, which, goes, etc. are parts of the subordinate clauses. Where is an adverbial modifier of place? When is adverbial modifier of time? Uh, what is an object, etc. For instance, I know where he lives. So, where he lives is an object clause, and where is an adverbial modifier of place in it. I know when he will arrive, when is an adverbial modifier of time in the object clause, or, or I know what he said, what is an object in the object subordinate clause, and I don't know whose car it is, whose is an attribute, in the subordinate clause. Clauses are connected asyndetically when they are linked without a congestion or a connective word. In writing, asyndetical coordination is always marked by a comma, a semicolon, or a colon. For instance, I have only one explanation, I hate you, while asyndetical subordination is not marked. For instance, I remember the day I first met him. When speaking, clauses are joined within the sentence by means of interaction. With some clauses, the inverted word order serves as a means of subordination and is equivalent to a conjunction. For instance, had she been near him, she would have told him everything. It's a complex sentence with an adverbial clause of condition, had she been near him. 
which is marked by inversion that makes the use of the conditional conjunction if unnecessary. It would be logical and not grammatical to say if she had been near him. Or another sentence, I wonder who he is, in which the object subordinate clause who he is, is marked by inversion. Now, we'll discuss functional semantic types of subordinate clauses. Subordinate clauses may function as subject, subject complement, that's predicative, complement, that's object, and relative, attributive and adverbial clauses of complex sentences. On the basis of their potential functions, British and American grammarians, for instance, Kirk, Greenbaum, Leach, Hellerman and others distinguish four major categories of subordinate classes nominal, relative, adverbial, and comparative clauses. First, we'll focus on nominal subordinate cl clauses. Like noun phrases, nominal clauses may function as subject, subject complement that's predicative, and predicate complements, that's direct, indirect, and prepositional object clauses. However, the occurrence of nominal clauses is more limited than that of noun phrases, because semantically the clauses are normally abstract, that they refer to such abstractions as events, facts and ideas. Let's analyze these clauses, complex sentences with subject subordinate clauses. There are two types of complex sentences with subject clauses in English. The first type, to, type of subject subordinate clause precedes the main clause which is incomplete, the clause functioning as the subject of the complex sentence. That Chris liked Lee so much did not surprise me. So that Chris liked Lee so much is the subject to the principal clause did not surprise me. That we need a larger computer is obvious. So that we need a larger computer acts as a subject of the principal clause. And whether she likes the present is not clear to me. Whether she likes the present is the subject subordinate clause which functions as the subject of the principal clause. The second type of subject clause follows the main clause which begins with the introductory of dummy it. It was evident that he did not understand anything. Or, it's a miracle how he managed to escape the danger. In modern English, due to the fixed word order, the subject cannot follow the predicate unless some formal element is used to fill in the place of the subject. Therefore, the introductory it and the subject clause are correlated to form a compound subject of the main clause in which the dummy it constitutes its formal part while the subject clause represents its lexical part. The second type is represented by complex sentences with predicative clauses. Predicative clause performs the function of the nominal part of the predicate. Following the link verb, the so-called Copula. The link verb is mostly expressed by the pure copula B, as well as by the specifying links sim and look. The use of other specifying links is occasional. The predicative clause, like other nominal clauses, can be introduced by the conjunctions that, whether, as if, and as though. For instance, the trouble is that I don't know him at all, or she looks as though she has never met him. The third type comprises 
complex sentences with object or complement clauses. Complement clauses perform the function of an object denoting a situation of the process expressed by the verbal predicate of the main clause. Object clauses may be prepositional and non-prepositional. I notice that he spoke English well enough is the non-prepositional object clause, while I'm sorry for what I said to you yesterday is a prepositional object clause. The preposition connected with a conjunctive pronoun in a complement or object clause may occur at the end of the subordinate clause. Such a preposition is called a detached or end preposition. For example, we have detached prepositions in these sentences. I'll read them. I don't understand what they are talking about. About is a detached preposition too. I wonder what you are looking at. It is a detached preposition. He asked who I was waiting for. For is a detached preposition. And I asked him where he was coming from. From is a detached preposition here. So, finally we want to discuss types of relative clauses. A relative, that's attributive clauses, represent a type of subordinate clause which modifies a head noun. They are embedded within the main clause by means of relative pronouns who, whom, who's, which, or relative adverbs when, where, how, why, as well as by subordinating conjunction that. Relative clauses are classified into four main types, restrictive, descriptive or non-restrictive, continuative and a positive. The restrictive relative clause performs a purely identifying function singling out the referent of the antecedent, which is always preceded by the definite article they. In other words, this type of relative clauses restricts the possible set of the class of things just to the subset that the speaker wants to talk about. For instance, in this sentence, I met the students who had not read the book. The students is the head noun which is followed by the restrictive relative clause. The speaker implies that he did not just meet the students, he met a specific subset of students, only those who had not read the book. The descriptive relative clause exposes some characteristic of the antecedent as such. It should be noted that the antecedent in the descriptive relative clauses is always preceded by the indefinite article a or n. Or n, for instance, and in the complex sentence, at last we found the place where we could make a fire. The relative clause is descriptive. The continuative relative clause gives some additional information about the antecedent, thus developing the chain of situation denoted by the sentence as a whole. Since the antecedent in the continuative relative clause is usually represented by a proper name which refers to a concrete individual, it can be left out without destroying the meaning of the sentence. This can be tested easily if you replace relative subordinator by the coordinative conjunction and plus personal pronoun. For instance, I phoned to Mr. Smith, who recognized me at once and invited me to his office, can be replaced or and transformed in this sentence. I phoned to Mr. Smith and he recognized me at once and invited me to his office. The last type of relative clauses is the appositive relative clause, which refers to a substantive antecedent 
of abstract semantics, defining or clarifying its concrete meaning in the context. Therefore, a positive clauses are nearer to restrictive clauses than the rest of relative clauses, according to the type of the antecedent, that is the head noun, all the positive clauses fall into three groups. A positive clauses which modify abstract nouns like fact, idea, question, suggestion, news, information, etc. For instance, the news that John had married Helen made a stir among the friends, or the fact that he lost all his money is a great shock for him. So, uh, the second type is a positive clauses which modify abstract names of adverbial relations such as time, moment, place, condition, purpose, etc., which are usually preceded by the definite article. For instance, we saw him at the moment when he was opening the door, or I remember the time when he went to school together, or they did or they did it with the purpose that no one might escape the punishment. A positive clauses which define the meaning of the antecedent represented by the indefinite or demonstrative pronouns. For instance, I can't agree with all what you are telling me. Everything what you see in this room is yours. Thus, we have discussed different classification of sentences, the set of which reflects the variable representation of reality according to communicative, structural, and functional semantic parameters. Thank you very much.